After nearly two weeks of inactivity, SpaceX has resumed rocket testing at Starbase. In preparation for a Super Heavy Booster 7 static fire test, SpaceX carried out three back-to-back -back orbital launch mount fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system tests on Monday morning. For those unaware, this system is designed to purge the launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water, effectively cleaning and preventing any volatile mixtures of methane and oxygen underneath the pad before engine ignition. After several attempts to load propellants into the booster, SpaceX abandoned the test on Monday for some unknown reason. The next static fire test attempt took place on Tuesday, November 29. On Tuesday afternoon, teams began loading propellants into Booster 7. The oxygen tank was filled completely with liquid oxygen, while the methane tank was filled with liquid methane to almost 10% of its capacity. At 1.41 p.m. local time, SpaceX activated the launch mount fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system. 20 seconds later, Booster 7 fired 11 of its 33 Raptor engines for about 13 seconds, producing nearly 25 meganewtons of thrust. It was the longest duration multi-engine firing of the massive booster so far. Booster 7 conducted a 20-second long static fire test on August 11, but that was a single-engine test. Tuesday's test was the first static fire for Booster 7 since November 14, when the huge vehicle lit up 14 Raptor engines. Hours after that 14-engine test, Elon Musk tweeted that the next booster test would be a 20-second long Raptor firing, with maximum oxygen fill to test the autogenous pressurization system. Autogenous pressurization involves heating a small amount of propellant inside the gas generator until it turns into a gas, then sending it back into the propellant tank to keep the liquid propellant inside it at the required pressure necessary to feed the rocket's engines. Even though Tuesday's test was a test to evaluate the autogenous pressurization system, it wasn't a 20-second long test, as Musk mentioned. Two new Raptor engines were delivered to the launch site on Thursday morning. Hours later, teams removed two Raptors from Booster 7. One of the removed engines was the Raptor Center engine, and the other was the outer Raptor Boost engine. After that, the two new engines were installed in place of the removed engines. In short, within 17 hours, SpaceX swapped two Booster 7 engines. The engines removed from the booster were later transported back to the build site. The engines may have been damaged during the recent static fire test. On Friday afternoon, the launch tower arms lifted Booster 7 from the orbital launch mount and placed it on a transport stand. It's currently not clear why the booster was removed from the launch mount. If the booster is damaged during the static fire test and requires repair, or if the vehicle needs an upgrade, it will be transported back to the build site in the coming days. The 14-engine static fire on November 14 witnessed the concrete beneath the orbital launch mount blasting off and raining down due to the intense heat and pressure from the engine exhaust. A week ago, SpaceX reinforced the launch pad floor with highly resistant and long-lasting Fondag cement to prevent such damage during future tests and launches. It is a dry-mixed concrete that is 7 to 10 times more durable than normal Portland cement concrete and is exceptionally stable at temperatures ranging from minus 180 degrees centigrade to plus 1110 degrees centigrade. Despite being reinforced with concrete specially designed for aggressive environments such as high temperatures and repeated thermal shocks, the pad was damaged again during Tuesday's test. In this epic spaceflight hoop cam footage, you can see concrete beneath the launch mount raining down during the test. However, compared to the November 14 test, Tuesday's 11-engine test generated less debris and therefore caused less damage to the pad. I believe SpaceX should place a flame deflector under the launch mount during future tests to protect the launch pad floor from engine exhaust. A few minutes after the Tuesday static fire test, a fire developed around the piping that goes over the launch mount legs. The launch mount fire extinguisher system worked for about three minutes to extinguish the fire completely. Over the past few weeks, Starship 24 has been sitting on suborbital launch pad B, undergoing repair and upgrade work. Almost all of the thermal protection system tiles removed from the aft section of the ship have been replaced in the past few days. SpaceX added additional reinforcement to the joints of the ship's stainless steel rings before replacing those tiles. SpaceX seems to have determined that the spacecraft needs to be strengthened in various places based on recent test data. The scaffolding built around the ship to help with tile replacement has now grown to the height of the ship's payload bay section. I think the payload bay section also needs repairs and upgrades. The nose cone forward dome assembly of Starship 26 was moved into the high bay on November 27. The primary structure of the ship will be complete with one more stacking operation. Prefabrication of the section for the Kennedy Space Center's second Starship launch tower is progressing at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility.
As of November 25, four of the nine sections have been almost completely prefabricated, and work has begun on the fifth section. SpaceX recently installed a drawworks mechanism at the base of the Starship Launch Tower at Launch Complex 39A. The drawworks is responsible for raising and lowering the Launch Tower's rocket catching and stacking arms. SpaceX recently released a job notification seeking a mechanical engineer to work on crew starships. This means that SpaceX has begun designing and developing crewed Starship vehicles that will one day carry humans into deep space. The mechanical engineer working on cruise ships will be responsible for designing and developing next-generation structures, mechanisms, or interior systems for crew starship vehicles. A crewed starship must have sufficient life support systems to keep astronauts alive during their months-long journey. Also, the ship must be able to shield its crew from space radiation. Since a starship's stainless steel hull is insufficient to protect astronauts from space radiation, the ship must have some form of radiation shielding inside. According to SpaceX, the crewed Starship design solutions will be driven by all future crew Starship missions, such as lunar, Mars, and deep space missions. Now, let's discuss some of the major science and technology updates from the past week. SpaceX's latest Dragon cargo ship arrived at the International Space Station on November 27, delivering thousands of kilograms of food, water, scientific experiments and technology demonstrations. SpaceX launched the CRS-26 Cargo Dragon resupply mission to the space station on November 26 from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission marked the first for Dragon C211, the third Cargo Dragon variant in SpaceX's fleet. The rocket's first stage, making its first flight, landed on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean seven and a half minutes after launch, and the rocket's upper stage deployed the Dragon spacecraft into low Earth orbit 12 minutes after liftoff. The Dragon spacecraft carried nearly 3,500 kilograms of supplies, equipment, and several science investigations to the crew aboard the station, including the next pair of rollout solar arrays, designed to be deployed atop the larger original arrays. There are six rollout solar arrays installations planned, and astronauts have already installed two and mounted hardware for three more during a spacewalk on November 15. Collectively, the new arrays will generate 120 kilowatts of power, increasing the station's electricity supply by 20 to 30 percent. The Dragon supply ship autonomously docked with the space-facing docking port on the space station's Harmony module about 17 hours after its launch. After docking, astronauts aboard the space station opened hatches and unpacked cargo inside the spacecraft's pressurized compartment. Dragon will remain at the station for about 45 days before departing the research outpost in mid-January for a parachute-assisted splashdown off the coast of Florida. NASA's Orion spacecraft exited the distant retrograde orbit around the moon on December 1 and is now ready to return to Earth. The Orion spacecraft, launched on November 16 as part of the Artemis 1 mission, entered a distant retrograde orbit around the moon on November 25. The spacecraft fired the main engine in its European service module for 88 seconds on November 25th to change the velocity and place itself into the designated orbit. Balanced between the gravitational pulls of Earth and the Moon, the distant retrograde orbit is a highly stable orbit where little fuel is required to stay. Orion remained in that orbit for six days, long enough to complete half a lap around the Moon and test the spacecraft systems in a deep space environment. The spacecraft reached its greatest distance from Earth on November 28, at more than 432,000 kilometers. The capsule set a new record on that trajectory, getting farther from Earth than any previous human-rated spacecraft. The previous record of 400,171 kilometers was held by NASA's Apollo 13 mission, which looped around the Moon and returned to Earth after an oxygen tank in the service module failed in deep space. On Thursday, December 1, Orion fired its main engine for 105 seconds to set the spacecraft on course for a close lunar flyby. On December 5, the spacecraft will fly 127 kilometers above the lunar surface and perform the return-powered flyby burn which will commit Orion on its course toward Earth. The splashdown of the Orion capsule in the Pacific Ocean is scheduled for December 11. Elon Musk has announced that his company, Neuralink, will begin the clinical trials of brain chip implants in human brains within the next six months. The announcement came during an event at Neuralink headquarters in California on November 30th. Neuralink Corporation is an erotechnology company co-founded by Elon Musk, Max Hadak, and Paul Marala in 2016. The company develops implantable brain-computer interfaces to let people control a computer or mobile device anywhere they go. The Neuralink device employs 5 micron diameter flexible neural threads sewn into the brain's gray matter to form connections with surrounding neurons. The device then translates neuronal spikes into data that a computer can interpret. 
The company claims that the state-of-the-art Neuralink technology, which is in the development stage, will one day make humans hyper-intelligent and let paralyzed people regain their ability to move. During the event on Wednesday, DJ Sao, vice president of Implant at Neuralink, stated that the company is working closely with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to get approval to launch its first clinical human trial in the next six months. Neuralink is currently testing the device on primates to prove that the surgery is safe and that the implant can stay in the brain for a long time. According to Musk, the first two human applications targeted by the Neuralink device will be restoring vision and enabling the movement of muscles in people who cannot do so. Uh, the, the, the first two applications we're going to aim for in humans um, are restoring uh, vision. And uh, the, I think this is like notable in that even if someone has never had vision ever, like they were born blind, uh, we're, we believe they can, they, they can, we can still restore vision uh, because the, the visual part of the the visual part of the cortex is still still there, and then the uh, the other application being in the motor cortex, uh, where we would initially enable someone who has no ability, to, almost no ability to operate their muscles. You know, sort of like a sort of Stephen Hawking type situation, and um, enable them to operate their phone faster than someone who has hand, working hands. I mean, as miraculous as it may sound, we're confident that it is possible to restore full body functionality to someone who has a severed spinal cord. Musk and his teammates offered many more details regarding Neuralink technology and its progress during Wednesday's event, which you may watch from the link provided in the description. China's Shenzhou 15 spacecraft carrying three Taikonauts successfully arrived at the Tiangong Space Station on Tuesday. The Shenzhou-15 spacecraft was launched atop a Long March 2F rocket from Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center on November 29 at 3.08 p.m. UTC. About 10 minutes after the launch, Shenzhou-15 separated from the rocket and entered low Earth orbit. The three-member team for the six-month mission is led by veteran Taikonaut Fei Junlong and two first-time Taikonauts, Deng Qinming and Zhang Lu. The Shenzhou-15 spacecraft docked with the space station more than six hours after the launch, and the three Taikonauts were greeted with warm hugs by the three-member Shenzhou-14 crew aboard the station. The Shenzhou-15 mission marks the start of full operations aboard Jiangong, with the trio lined up to perform more than 100 experiments, using 24 specially designed science cabinets installed in the station. The crew will also conduct three to four spacewalks before their return in May 2023. Meanwhile, the Shenzhou-14 Taikonauts, who have been working at the space station since June, will return to Earth in early December. China is planning to launch two crewed missions to the Jiangong station annually, over its operational period of the following 10 years. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.